those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those who are waiting, watching through live stream, what a blessing it is that we can continue not only to worship the Lord God together, but also to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And with that, I invite you to get your Bibles and turn them to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. And we will read from verse 14 to 21. And if you're able to stand, please let us stand as we honor God even in the reading of His Word. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that we have just read. And truly, Lord God, we bow our hearts, acknowledging, Lord, that without you, we can do nothing and we are nothing. But we thank you because of your great love. You have saved us in Christ Jesus. And according to the riches of His glory, Lord God, may indeed you strengthen us with your Holy Spirit, even as we hear your voice and listen. And may we be able to comprehend, Lord God, together, even your love, the magnitude of your love for us that you have demonstrated in Christ Jesus. To Him be glory even now. Amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is Pray For... Dot, dot, dot. That is to say, the content of our prayer. We have been learning from this book of Ephesians since the beginning of this year. And in chapter 1, we learned the riches of God's grace where He saved us from our sins and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The blessing of choosing us to be holy. The blessing of adopting us to sonship in Christ Jesus. Redeeming us with the precious blood of Christ and the blessing of being marked and sealed with His Holy Spirit that guarantees all these things. And we repeat this over and over again because it's easy for us to, to just to take these things for granted. We've heard it so many times. And we forget that if not for the sovereign grace of God, none of us would be here. Not realizing that this is the basis of our Christian living, our conduct, our behavior that we will learn from chapters 4 to 6. And that's why the Apostle Paul expresses prayer to God for the church, even in chapter 1. That we, the church, may have the spirit of wisdom and the knowledge of God. And that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which God has called us, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. And not only do we tend to take this for granted, but often than not, we forget. That is, we forget the rich salvation that God gave us, how He sovereignly chose to save us, and not because of any righteous things or good things that we have done, but because simply of His mercy and the riches of His grace and His infinite love. We forget that if not for the sovereign grace of God, we would still be dead 
in our transgressions and sins. And being dead, that is spiritually speaking, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. But God, who is rich in mercy and because of His great love for us, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. But we remember that this salvation is available to all. Not just for one group of people, which the Jews thought was only for them. No, it's, it's for everyone, even for the Gentiles. And remember, there was hostility between these two groups of people. Prejudice, discrimination, alienation, division. There was this wall of separation. But Christ, the Prince of Peace, destroyed this dividing wall of hostility and through His death on the cross, brought peace between the two, making the two one. And His purpose was to create in Himself one new humanity, which is called the church. And I love that song that we sung earlier about, we are the church. We are His children. We are not the world. You can sing that song if you want. We're not the world. We are the We are the church. And this is who we are. People who are different from each other in many ways, but God brought us together as one in Jesus Christ, who is our peace, joined together in true unity. And if we're not careful, we will act according to our differences and in prejudice, in discrimination, and then creating that hostility again, which leads to division and separation, forgetting that Jesus died to bring us together. That's what He wants to make every effort for us, to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace that we read in Ephesians 4 verse 3. Remember, there's only one body. That is His body, the church. And this was a mystery kept secret, but was revealed by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the prophets. His, his, his intent was now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be made known to all, particularly the angelic beings for God's greater glory. And what this shows us is the importance of the church to God. The church is His treasure. And God wants to display His glory in the church and in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church throughout all generations forever and ever. And so this is what we have learned in a nutshell. In chapters 1 to 3, it is about the doctrine or the teaching about our spiritual identity that is who we are in Christ. Sinners saved by grace and now called saints, God's holy people, the church. And also we've learned about the doctrine of what we possess or have, namely all the blessings or every blessings in Christ. And then in chapters 4 to 6, we will deal with the duty, our duty or responsibility that goes with our spiritual identity and responsibility. We can put it this way. In chapters 1 to 3 is the doctrine and chapters 4 to 6 is our duty. Chapters 1 to 3 is our belief. Chapters 4 to 6 is our behavior. And none of these is easy. And that's why the Apostle Paul expressed his prayer for the church twice. In chapter 1, the prayer was for enlightenment, so that we may see this and not take it for granted. Now in chapter 3 in our text this morning, the prayer is for empowerment. And we need prayer for both areas of our spiritual beings in the knowing and in the doing of God's Word. Remember, praying to God is an act of humbling ourselves before Him and acknowledging our need and our dependence on Him. Let us not think that we can know God's Word and obey God's Word apart from prayer. We don't have any power or strength in ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit who gives us the power both to understand and to follow God's Word. 
Apart from him, we can do nothing, and without prayer, we will fail. And so the Apostle Paul, who is a man of prayer himself, expresses his prayer to God for the church. Because the calling of God for us, the church, is a high calling. Both our identity and role or responsibility that God gave us can only truly be realized and accomplished in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit who is in us. And that's why, as we begin our lesson now, let us learn from this prayer. Pray for what? The Apostle Paul begins his prayer for the church by saying in verse 14, as we have read, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. For this reason. What reason? The reason of the mystery regarding the church. The secret that is now revealed. That sinners who are separated from God and separated from each other, that is rebellious towards God and, and hostile to each other, are now members together in one united body and partakers together of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Could you imagine that? The people that you hate, the people that you're prejudiced with, for whatever reason, God loves and God saves. And as mentioned earlier, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be made known to all. The wisdom of God in saving sinners and bringing them together for God's greater glory. And so for this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. Well, first of all, this does not mean that God is the Father of all and that everyone is a child of God. It's not talking about universalism. Remember, not everyone is a child of God, but only those who receive Jesus Christ and believe in His name. As we have read so many times in John chapter 1, verse 12, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. And just because you go to church, it doesn't make you a child of God. Just because you agree and you say, Amen, Hallelujah, does not make you a child of God. It is when you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And so as believers of Christ, we are now children of God. And so God is not only our God, He is also our Heavenly Father. And that we are all members of God's forever family. And now, some of God's family members are already in heaven. They're up there enjoying while others, other members of God's family are still here on earth like us. But one day, we will all be together, literally, physically, with resurrected, glorified bodies. Meantime, we are here as His church, as God's holy people to live our lives for His glory. Again, it is a high calling and an honor to be given such a calling and a humbling one too. And that's why the apostle expresses that prayer by bowing his knees before the Father. Now, this is not an instruction or a command that when we pray, we have to be on our knees all the time. You can pray standing, you can pray sitting, you can pray prostrate laying down there on the floor. But what this is, is a demonstration of the most natural thing to do when we are humbled by God's grace and by His goodness that we don't deserve. When we realize that our nothingness or unworthiness before the Holy God, yet by His grace, He chose to love us and forgive us and save us and call us His own and even to make us be a member of His family. We bow down in humility and in worship to Him and realize that we are what we are and we have what we have all because of God's amazing grace. That's what kneeling down before the Lord expresses. Humility, gratefulness. Now I know that for some, it's impossible for them to kneel because, for, because of some physical condition. 
Or when you turn 57, you begin to have a difficulty in kneeling down. But you, if you are able to kneel, it's a good practice to do before the Lord. But more than the external position, it is the posture of the heart that the Lord really looks at. A heart that is humble, a heart that is reverent and dependent and grateful to the Lord. And this is the attitude that we must have when we go to God in prayer. And so the Apostle Paul humbles himself before the God, God the Father, the Father of us all. And that is where we are to direct our prayers, our Heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with praying to Jesus, but there is this reminder when we call God our Father that we have a God who is also our Father who cares, provides, protects as we are His children. Remember, this is what the Lord taught His disciples how to pray in Matthew 6. Jesus said, when you pray, say what? Our Father. Because it reminds us of that relationship that we have with God and our relationship with God's family, with one another. So that when we pray, we're not only praying for individual self or our individual needs, but we remember to pray for one another in the family of God. Paul prayed for his brothers and sisters in the Lord. He prayed for God's forever family, which is the church. And let me ask you, do you pray for your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Do you pray for your church family? I know that many of you do. And I'm grateful to God for your love, not only for Him, but for His family. And your ministry to the church, especially praying for the church family. But what do you pray for the church? Well, let's look at what Paul prayed for. What is the content of his prayer for the church? Back to our text. He says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The apostle's prayer for the church, which is us today, is that we, the church, may be strengthened with power according to the riches of God's grace. I know that in the New International Version, it says, out of His glorious riches. Well, the better translation is according to His riches, not out of. Well, what's the difference, you may ask? Well, let's say a millionaire like, um, I don't know millionaires, but how about Michael Jordan or Shaquille O'Neal? gives you $1,000 for charity. When they give that, they're giving out of their riches. But if they give you a million or five million or $10 million, they are giving according to. That is in line with, in proportion to their riches. When God gives, He gives according to the riches of His glory, which means there is abundance. There is unlimited resources. He will never run out of supply to provide whatever you and I may need. Not just in the material, physical, but spiritual. So Paul prayed that according to the riches of God's glory, God may strengthen you with power. Listen, when we pray, we access or avail and experience God's power, which gives us the strength that we need in and for our lives. And that's why we need to pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. Yes, in bad times, but also in good times. Pray especially when we are at our lowest and weakest. Because when we pray, again, we avail and experience God's power. How? By what means? Well, it says there, through His Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
the source of our power. The Holy Spirit strengthens us to be what God wants us to be and empowers us to do what God wants us to do. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, if you remember, Jesus said to His disciples, You will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Paul prayed that through God's Spirit, you and I, that is we the church, may be strengthened with power. And as we have mentioned before, more prayer, more power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power, spiritually speaking. When we pray, we are strengthened with God's power. Where? Where are we strengthened? In our body? No, in the inner being. What is this inner being? Well, it is you, the person inside you, living in your body. Remember, you are a person. You are not a body. You have a body, but you are a person. Your inner being is the spirit, the soul, the mind, the heart, where the will and the emotions and the passions are. It's all there in the heart, our inner being. And everything flows out of our inner being, beginning from the heart. Our emotions, our attitudes, our choices, our values, our words. The thing is, we express our heart, that is our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, our inner being. We express it through our external being, which is our physical body. The world that we live in, the world that we live in puts its primary importance on the physical body, the external, the outer, the material. For the world, the important, the, 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 what's more important is the physique, right? Flawless skin, gorgeous hair, what kinds of clothes you wear, what car you drive, where you live. Well, nothing wrong with those things in themselves. But if we are to glorify God in our body, in what we say and what we do, even with one another in the church, we need to put primary importance on the spiritual, the inner person, which is far more important. We need to be strengthened in our inner being because our inner self is weak in itself. Our mind can be easily influenced or controlled by the flesh, the desires of the sinful flesh, which will manifest or will show in our conversation with one another and how we treat each other. But if we are strengthened in our inner being with the power through the Holy Spirit who uses His Word, the Bible, to renew our mind and to change our hearts, then we will be able to do what God wants us to do, especially in the church where He wants His glory manifest, where God wants to display His glory as we relate with one another in a way that honors and glorifies God. It's our inner being that needs to be strengthened. Our mind, our hearts, more than our physical bodies. So pray for your inner being which is eternal. More than your external physical body which is temporary. And pray that prayer for the church as well. Those, that's now part of the dot, dot, dot. Pray for. This is what the apostle prayed for the church. You see, often when we pray for others or for individual self, we pray for our physical needs, our temporary material needs or external needs more than our spiritual or internal needs. So for example, we often pray for physical healing, for relief from allergies, for physical protection, for a job, for weather, for a parking spot, for a sale. I'm not saying that that is wrong or that we shouldn't pray for those things. There's nothing wrong in praying for any of those things. As a matter of fact, it's good that we pray even for our physical and material needs. And we need to do that. The Bible does not prohibit or condemn such prayers. 
But what about your inner being? What about our spiritual needs? What about praying for the heart and its desires, its affections? What about praying for our mind, our thought life? What about praying for our faith and love for the Lord and for one another, for unbelievers who are lost in sin? When was the last time you prayed for strength to stand firm in God's word? Where, when, when was the last time you prayed for endurance in the midst of trials? For courage to live for Christ. For boldness to declare the gospel. For compassion to minister to others, especially to the lost. For patience and understanding as we relate with one another in the church. For God's strength with power in the inner being. Paul prayed that according to the riches of God's glory, we may be strengthened with power through His Holy Spirit in our inner being. Why? What is the reason? Verse 17 of our text. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's the reason. That's the reason why we need to be strengthened with power in our inner being. So that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. What does that mean, Pastor? Is Paul saying that Christ is not living in your hearts now that you're a believer? Isn't it that the moment that you and I believe in Jesus Christ, He lives in our hearts in the person of the Holy Spirit? Yes, absolutely. But the question is, is Christ dwelling in your heart? You see, the word dwell means to feel at home. Not just residing, but settling down in comfort. Is Christ at home? In other words, is Christ comfortable living in your heart? Or is He uncomfortable because your heart is filled with sinful desires? Now, why do we allow our hearts to be filled with sin and follow the desires of our flesh? Because honestly, we don't trust God many times. We think we know what is good for us. And so we do things according to our own understanding instead of trusting in the Lord with all our hearts and not lean or depend on our own understanding. You see how weak we are? Because our quick response in challenges or difficulties is what's comfortable for me? What would make me feel good? But when our inner being is strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, we will trust and obey God's word. And we will overcome the flesh, the desires of the sinful flesh. By faith, we can live in submission to His word as the Holy Spirit leads us. And experience His peace, His joy, His love. And overcome any challenge we may have within and without. And that's why God gave us and filled us with His Holy Spirit. He gave us His Holy Spirit and filled us with His Holy Spirit, not so that we can have goosebumps and run around the sanctuary and howl and have a sensational experience. No. He gave us His Holy Spirit and filled us with His Holy Spirit so that we may be strengthened with power in the inner being and live our lives that glorify God. Live as an overcomer through Him who loved us. As we have read so many times in Romans 8.37, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. That's what Romans chapter 8 is about. Life in the Spirit. And it ends with the assurance of overcoming challenges within and without that is outside of us. When our inner being is strengthened with power so that we live in a consistent obedience, not perfect obedience, but a consistent obedience to God's word, then Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. Using the illustration of a house that has many rooms, when Christ goes into the house of your life, or your heart, or your inner being. When Christ goes into your bedroom and opens your closet, what will He find? Will He be comfortable or feel at home with the secrets that you hide in your closet? When He opens or when He goes to your dining room, 
what will he see on the menu? Will it be a list of sinful desires that just cater and satisfy your worldly appetites? Lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and the prestige or the pride of life? How about if he goes to your library? Do you even have a library? How about if he goes to your library, which is basically your mind? Will he find trash, the trash of human wisdom that pervade the culture that we live in? Unbiblical thoughts or ideas that sets itself up against the knowledge of God? It's sad to say there are many so-called Christians who call themselves Christians and go to Protestant evangelical churches, but yet they allow the mind of the culture and the world to get into their thoughts so that they support what the world hails and promotes. The idea of, of equity and the woke culture that has influenced many in the church. How about if Jesus goes to your living room? Who are the people that you hook up with and hang, hang around with? Are they godly or are they the worldly companions? How about your activities? Will he be comfortable with what you spend most of your time with? In entertainment, for example, if the Lord asks for your computer or iPad or phone, what will he find you watching? And he goes on to every corner of your house. And since he is Lord, your Lord, by faith, meaning when you trust him, he will remove and clean anything that makes him uncomfortable. Because only when he has cleaned every room and every closet and every corner of your life from sin and self-centeredness can Jesus truly dwell in comfort. Settle down in your heart and be at home. And that's why we need to be strengthened with power in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. When Christ dwells in our hearts, that is when He is at home and comfortable in our hearts, we will have a deeper understanding and experience of God's presence and God's love resulting in a deeper and stronger sense of security. And that is so important in our daily living. Knowing that God is with you and that He loves you. And you will not want anything else but Him. Because you are satisfied with who you are in Him and satisfied with what you possess in Christ. So that you will not go after, go after the counterfeit happiness that Satan offers through the temporary deceitful things of the world, the lure that entices our fleshly and sinful desires that results in emptiness, frustration, misery, hopelessness, depression, even death. Because now you have a deeper and fuller knowledge and experience of God's presence and of God's love in your heart. Just like what the Apostle Paul mentioned in his prayer back to Ephesians 3, verse 17. Look at what he says. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. And that is what was just mentioned earlier. God wants us to be deeply rooted in His love. Like a plant or tree that has deep roots and grounded like a building that is established having a strong and secure foundation. This is a picture of stability and security. When you are rooted and grounded in God's love, you will have the stability and security to stand through the challenges in life. That is to say, when you know deeply how much deeply loves you, I mean, how much deeply God loves you, his love makes you able to stand. Stand what? Rejection. His love enables you to confront loneliness. Because His love fills your deepest desire and your greatest need, you'll be stable. 
and you will have such a security that you can face failure. God's love frees you from trying to impress people just to be accepted and belong because you know that God has accepted you and you belong to Him and you are accepted and you belong to His family as well. That's what happens when Christ is in our hearts. We will have a deeper knowledge and experience of God's love. We will have that stability and security. We are deeply rooted and grounded in His, His love. Not the shallow sentimentalism of human emotions. That love is unstable, unreliable, it can, and we can easily be carried away. But the strong and enduring, powerful love of God, that is the agape love, the self-giving, the sacrificial, serving kind of love that He Himself demonstrated in Christ. A love that He has given us so that we can love Him and love others with the same kind of love. Remember 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, it says, This is how we know what love is. When you give roses and chocolates. No. I mean, that's human. That's just emotional. But this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Practically speaking, here is what it looks like. If anyone has a material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with what? Actions and truth. What is truth? The Word of God. In other words, our actions is directed by what God says. In his word. That's not enough. First John chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. When Christ dwells in us, because our inner being is strengthened so that we trust and obey His word, then we will know of this love in a deeper way. He will dwell in us. As verse 13 to 16 says, this is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen clearly, uh, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God He has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And so, being deeply rooted and grounded in love, the apostle prayed that we may. We may what? Well, let's go back to our text in verse 18. We may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So that we may have the power, as in we may be able because without power, we are not able. And remember that power is the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, without the Holy Spirit of God, we cannot. We cannot comprehend or even appreciate the love of God. But with the power of the Holy Spirit and being deeply rooted and grounded in love, we may be able together with all the saints, God's holy people, the church, referring to the brothers and sisters in the Lord, fellow believers and followers of Christ, together, which means what? Well, which means number one, the knowledge and exercise and experience of God's love is given to and commanded of every child of God. The the knowledge and exercise and experience of God's love is given to and commanded of 
every child of God. And therefore, number two, the deeper and fuller knowledge, the deeper and fuller knowledge and experience of God's love will not happen in isolation or seclusion or separation or separateness, but in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. That is how we will experience and have a deeper knowledge of the love of God in the context of fellowship. And that's, where I, that's why we have verses like this in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25. And what does it say? Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. See that? That's why the Bible tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You know, it's a good thing that we have technology so that we can access the worship service on a given Sunday morning or whenever we gather for worship. But that is provided. Technology is provided to us and intended for us to use only when we cannot attend in person for one reason or another. Like, for example, if you're ill or you're in bed, you're not physically able, someone needs your assistance, they are not physically able, or maybe you don't have a ride, or maybe you just overslept. But God's Word, God's will, God's design for His people, the church, is to meet together in person and be with the church, not watch the church. Because besides worshiping God together, God wants us to fellowship, that is to connect with one another and to minister to one another. And in the ministering of God's word and God's love with one another, we will experience the sacrificial love. We will experience the receiving of forgiveness and the forgiving of others, which cannot happen when we watch. When we watch the church. But when we fellowship and connect with one another and tell each other about our own discoveries and experiences of God's love, we actually help each other grow in the knowledge of God's love. We grasp and we begin to comprehend and have a better, if not a fuller, understanding of how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. The width of God's love is wide enough to welcome anyone. Is that the love that you exercise? The length of God's love has no end. It is infinite, eternal. God's love will never end. The height of God's love lifts, uh, lifts us up and seated us with Christ in the heavens. And the depth of God's love reaches down to the lowest hell. I mean, imagine we were dead in sin. Yet God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were still in our sinful or sinning state, Christ died for us. The magnitude of God's love in Christ Jesus. And none of us, none of us have the grasp of all this. None of us have the deep and full knowledge of all of all the dimensions of the love of God. Now, one of you or two may have a deeper and fuller knowledge of the wideness of God's love, while another has the knowledge of the length of God's love. You may have a deeper and fuller knowledge of the height of God's love, and I may know more of the depth of God's love, but together, as we minister God's love to one another, teaching and admonishing one another, we may be able to comprehend and experience the full spectrum of God's love. And when we understand God's love, knowing and experiencing the magnitude of this love, 
His love that none of us deserve, the more we will be able to relate with one another as in loving one another with the love that we ourselves have received even though we do not deserve. So that we relate with one another in humility, with gentleness, with compassion, with patience, with understanding, willing and ready to forgive in order to maintain the unity and the peace for the glory and honor of God, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, we will know God's love. As verse 19 says, back to our text, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So that we will know, that is, not just mentally or intellectually or know about this love, but to know experientially. Though we may not fully wrap our arms around God's love, mentally speaking, we may know it experientially, experience it, and be overwhelmed by His love so that we may be filled up to the fullness of God. That is to say, to be controlled solely and completely by God. Because Whatever fills you, controls you. So for example, if you are filled with fear, you will live in fear because fear controls you. If you are filled with alcohol, you are drunk. In other words, you are influenced or controlled by the alcohol. But if you are filled with God, filled with the Spirit of God, you are controlled by the Spirit of God. Now, if you have listened all this time, some of you or maybe all of you may be thinking, well, pastor, that sounds all good. <laughs> but I don't think I'll be able to do all that. Well, listen, none of us can do any of this for that matter in our own strength. And that's why we need to pray. Yes, for ourselves, but also for one another. And we need to pray for this. And we need to pray to God, our Father, who is able. We may not be able, but God is able. How able is God? Verse 20 to 21. Now to Him. To who? To who? To him, not to you, not to me, but to him, that is God, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What does this mean? We'll go through that next week. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. And I pray, Lord God, that as we have not only read, but heard, and by your Holy Spirit, really have grasped the immense love and truth that you have just poured upon us. But Lord, we confess that we are not able. And that's why we pray to you that as the apostle prayed, that we may be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and be rooted and grounded in your love. And by doing so, we may be able to grasp together, even as a church family, the width and the length and the depth and the height, and to experience the love of Christ that goes beyond intellectual knowledge and be filled with the fullness of God. Now I'd like to speak to you you who have been going to church, 
And just because you go to church, you think you're a child of God, may I tell you that salvation is not by your going to church. You may go to church, but not be a part of the church. Because to be part of the church, to be part of the family of God, that is to be a child of God, you need the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, ruling and reigning as Lord. And for that to happen, you need to repent of your sin and come before Him in humility and acknowledge that you need Jesus Christ. And so if you haven't done that, pray to Him and say to Him, Lord Jesus, I need You. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sin. I believe in You and receive You as Lord. Be my Lord. You don't have to say those exact words, but in your heart. And by faith, pray to the Lord. If this is your first time to pray that, I welcome you to the family of God. And it would be a great blessing to me if you would tell me so that you can be baptized in His name. So Father God, thank you once again. We continue to honor and worship you even now through our tithes and offerings and our closing song. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry.